good morning, everyone, and welcome to the part four of our Solstice webinar series. My name is uh, Katya Popova, and I'm a co-director of Large Solstice Project, which was operating in the Western Indian Ocean for the past four plus years. So this is a wrap up of the project, which unfortunately we cannot do in person in the Western Indian Ocean. So here we organized this uh, series of the webinars and you're participating in the final one on marine technologies for ocean sustainability. So without further ado, I will pass to Amani, uh, who is chairing our webinar today. Thank you. Hi everyone. So yeah, we've got um, a, a webinar about marine technology today. Um, um, but we're going to start off with a presentation from um, Zoe Jacobs about our massive open online course, the MOOC, um, which has been which has been really successful. And hopefully, some of you that are joining us today will will want to join that. Um, you can sign up at any time. On you go, Zoe. Thanks, Amani. Okay, so yes, good morning everyone. So I'm gonna talk about our MOOC, which is called Ocean Science in Action. Um, so first of all, what are MOOCs? So um, I think Amani just said they are massive open online courses. Um, so they act as a, uh, a digital tool to provide education, public engagement and capacity development. Um, and it really just facilitate, uh, facilitates online learning which has been particularly important over the last couple of years. Um, so they basically are made up of a series of lectures, which, are, um, which can contain videos, uh, some text, further reading, and then there are quizzes as well to keep it uh, interactive and engaging. So they are accessed via an online platform. Uh, so we use the uh, quite a well-known platform called FutureLearn. Um, and it all kind of centers around this um, ocean literacy, which is quite a popular buzzword at the moment for us. So um, to create a MOOC, it takes a really serious team effort. Um, so we have our, our team of lead educators. Um, sorry, Siri just decides to talk to me. Um, we have our uh, team of lead educators, which you can see on the right here. Uh, and these are um, all associated with the Solstice project, which is obviously what the webinar is about. Um, so these lead educators will be writing lectures and then providing uh, the material to go along with the lectures, which is um, quite demanding. Um, we also have a videographer and a graphics designer, which are integral to creating this MOOC. Um, we wanna keep the MOOC extremely interactive so lots of videos, footage, um, um, diagrams and graphs and things like that to keep it nice and engaging. Um, so it is quite expensive to make a MOOC. Um, we have uh, obviously staff that are needed to provide the material to produce the MOOC, but then it actually costs money to host the MOOC on that online platform. So. Um, it really needs to be written into funding proposals. Um, it's not a cheap or easy task. Um, and then of course we have a mentoring team as well. Huge part of the team when the MOOC is running online um, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail later. So this is our MOOC, um, Ocean Science in Action, Addressing Marine Ecosystems and Food Security in the Western Indian Ocean. So the course is aimed um, this particular course is aimed at people working within uh, marine related industries like fisheries um, in the Western Indian Ocean or the wider kind of global ocean. Um, but it can be, it's accessible to anyone, to be honest, um, especially because we feature uh, introductions to um, all of our topic areas, which means hopefully anyone um, will be able to follow. Uh, so as I said, this MOOC is uh, featured on FutureLearn um, and it's currently on demand at the moment, so it can be accessed now. Um, and I can provide, um, I'll put a link in the chat to um, if anyone would like to register. 
So it consists of 30 video lectures, um, which are centered on a couple of, of different themes. So uh, innovative marine technologies, which we used in the Solstice project, which I'll go into in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, and then challenges of the sustainable management of marine ecosystems uh, focused on uh, our three different, actually four different case studies we have now. Um, and um, the, the, the topic areas meet um, the uh, Decade of the Ocean Objectives and also the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and because of that, this MOOC was actually featured in a Future Learns uh, COP26 collection. So I'll give you a brief breakdown of the lectures and what the MOOC looks like. Um, so ours is run over four weeks, and then each week has different kind of subject material. So week one, we focus on um, uh, a bit about the uh, UN Decade of the Ocean, Sustainable Development Goals, um, and then we start our introduction into uh, marine robotics. The, uh, the second week uh, continues in the theme of our ocean technologies. So we have, um, we have ocean modeling and remote sensing. Um, and like the robotics um, videos on the, in the previous week, we have uh, introductions to these technologies. And then we have a, a few more lectures kind of targeting specific areas where these technologies can be applied. Week three starts going into some of our uh, case studies. So um, first of all, we introduce you to, uh, to the region, so the Western Indian Ocean, both in terms of um, the, the dynamics and biogeochemistry of this, of this part of the global ocean, but also we go into uh, the economic value of the Western Indian Ocean and who governs the ocean. Um, then our first uh, case study, which is uh, the, uh, about the offshore fishery on, over the North Kenya banks. Um, and then we have our South African case study, which is looking at the um, environmental drivers and socioeconomic consequences of the South African chocker squid fishery. And then um, another case study, which is new, um, new uh, to this particular run, which is looking at the world's strongest seasonal upwelling, uh, the Somali upwelling. Uh, and then the final week, we have our final case study, um, which is the small pelagic fisheries of the Pemba Channel in Tanzania. Um, we have a whole host of, um, of lectures dedicated to food security. Uh, and then we have a couple of lectures uh, showing you what it's like uh, to go on a research expedition um, on the kind of main ship or also with the marine robotics. Um, and I think uh, we're gonna show one of, those, um, one of those videos as part of this webinar. Uh, and then we wrap up um, with kind of what we would like to see in, within this decade. Um, and I think we're also showing one of those videos as well. So I'll keep that on brief for now and you get to see a bit more of that later. Um, so as Amani said at the beginning of this webinar, uh, the MOOC has been incredibly successful. We've had um, well over three and a half thousand total learners now um, from 140 different countries. Um, and you can see the breakdown of where our learners are uh, coming from. So the UK, is unsurprisingly one of our um, well the most well uh, represented region but then the western indian ocean is part of the next kind of the next biggest chunk which is brilliant um, and as i said uh, we have our uh, mentoring team which keeps keeps everything really engaging throughout throughout the run um, and this mentoring team is made up of early career researchers from um from our UK team based at the National Oceanography Centre, which is the top five, um, their photos. And then we also have uh, three early career researchers from uh, our Western Indian Asian partner institutions, which means we have quite a diverse range of expertise covering our technologies, but also um, social economics and also each of the case study regions. So having this mentoring team really encourages discussion um, we are on the ball to be answering questions as they come in, um, which really increases engagement with our learners. So it's not, uh, the mentoring team isn't facilitating all the time. Uh, so our, our MOOC has just been, uh, become on demand as of the 1st of November, where we have a facilitation period for one month at a time. So we've just been mentoring for uh, this last month, which has been brilliant. Um, and, uh, and then I think we're planning to do another facilitation month in probably February. Um, 
and that's all. So what I'm going to do now is show uh, show you guys the trailer for this MOOC. The health of the ocean is fundamental to the health of the whole planet. It is a major food resource and for over 1 billion people it is their primary source of animal protein. For millions of people it is also their main source of income. This free online course would introduce you to innovative marine technologies and to their applications which are contributing to global efforts to meet the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Earth observation satellites monitor the oceans daily, collecting a wide range of marine data, most of which are then made freely available from global archives. Marine autonomous systems are becoming ever more reliable and easy to use for environmental observations at a fraction of the cost of a research ship. Ocean models of increasingly high resolution make it possible to explore regional ecosystem dynamics and gain insights into reasons for variability and change. Together with our educators, you will explore how these technologies can form the basis for environmental research and monitoring programmes to deliver decision support for marine policy and development and resource management. Using case studies from research projects operating in the Western Indian Ocean, you will learn how marine science is applied to study the stability and collapse of fisheries, explore new frontiers of food security, and to understand the implications of the changing climate on delicate ecosystems. The course is aimed at anyone involved in the management or study of marine environments and those interested in the use of technology to study the ocean. We look forward to you joining us. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Zoe. Um, yeah, so I think we'll just follow that up with another video from our MOOC. Um, this one is a day in the life of the marine robotics team, and I will just share that now. lecture you will join an international glider team working in the Pemba Channel off the coast of Tanzania. You will learn about their objectives and share their challenges and successes. The glider team is operating out of Mkwani, a busy harbour town in the southwest of Pemba Island. Here they are setting up their base, preparing their instruments and embarking on daily expeditions into the Pemba Channel. Despite the majority of the preparation for the underwater gliders having already been done in the laboratories of the National Oceanography Centre in the UK, the team still had lots to do before the expeditions could properly start. Thankfully, the gliders did not sustain any damage during their long transport to Tanzania, and the gliders' communication between the team on the ground in Makwani and at the NOC was working fine. This wasn't always easy, as power and internet access were sometimes intermittent, but the team worked hard to resolve all issues alongside local partners. An important component of the glider work was measuring nutrients using a nutrient sensor developed at the NOC. The microfluidic sensor was integrated into the sea glider by Dr. Alex Beaton and measures the nitrate concentration of the ocean as the glider dives between the sea surface and down to a thousand meters depth. In addition to the gliders, the team also set up the other instruments that were needed for the daily expeditions in the Pemba Channel to measure temperature, ocean currents, weather and mixing. At first light each morning, the daily mission started with a glider deployment. This meant that the engineers made all the necessary checks during the transit to the designated waypoint of the day. Once the boat was on station, the engines were turned off to avoid any accidental damage to the equipment and the glider was deployed by hand. Before the glider is allowed to leave the surface, additional tests are run to make sure that the glider is communicating with the pilots back in the UK and that the system checks indicate that the glider is ready to dive. 
The most important tests are checks on the glider's communication via satellite, so the team can track the glider's location, check its status and retrieve data. Once all tests come back positive, the glider dives to its designated depth of hundreds of metres beneath the surface and works alone until it next surfaces and communicates home. The successful deployment of the gliders only gives the team a short break, as the more hands-on aspects of the data collection work can now begin. First to be deployed is the Acoustic Ocean Current Profiler, which measures the speed and direction of currents flowing through the Pemba Channel up to 500 metres depth, using the Doppler shift in the returning acoustic signal of free-flowing particles in the ocean. The team can use these data later to understand how currents in the Pemba Channel change with depth and time, and how they transport nutrients from the deep ocean up to phytoplankton at the surface, where photosynthesis can occur. Another important instrument used on the mission is a Rockland Scientific VMP, which stands for Vertical Microstructure Profiler. This profiler measures tiny fluctuations in the ocean over 500 times per second, which provides data that the team will use to estimate mixing in the ocean interior. This will provide valuable insight into how the structure of the ocean is transformed by fast-moving currents and how nutrients are distributed in the Pemba Channel. Combining these measurements with those provided by the glider and meteorological sensors will help the international team to better understand how the ecosystem of the Pemba Channel functions during the southeast monsoon. All good things come to an end, and so does a day at sea. As the sun approaches the horizon, the team perform the last tip of the day and it's time to go and find the glider. Despite having a GPS fix on the glider's last known position, the fast-moving currents of the Pemba Channel still provide a final challenge of the day to the team. Using years of experience, educated guesses and the sharp eyes of the MV Huntress crew, the team were able to eventually recover the glider each night and the long steam home begins for a well-deserved rest and a cold drink. After a long day at sea, it's now a great opportunity to go over the activity of the day and sift through the day's newly collected data and enjoy the sunset. While working at sea always brings a variety of challenges, fieldwork is one of the most rewarding aspects of being an oceanographer. Having the opportunity to meet with partners from across the globe, who each bring their own unique experience and expertise, makes these missions incredibly rewarding, providing opportunities to build new collaborations, but also friendships. Having the chance to work in the ocean rather than just working on the data from afar also provides oceanographers with improved intuition for the complex processes that contribute to ocean circulation and the marine life it sustains. So hopefully that's given you another taster of some of the, the MOOC content and um, what we are uh, what we're talking about today with the with the marine robotics. Um, next up, we've got um, Kennedy Kennedy Osaka, who is um, going to present his work um, that he did as part of the Solstice project using marine robots. So I'll hand over to Kennedy now. Yeah, thank you, Amani. <clears throat> uh, it's a flu season, so I just got some cold. So I just played the video. Um, I was hoping to give a presentation, but my voice is a bit hoarse. So let's see how the video goes. Tell me if you are able to. Welcome to my talk. That. Okay. Cheers. Focuses on application of marine robots for. Welcome to my talk that focuses on application of marine robots for management and conservation in the Western Indian Ocean. I'm Kennedy Suka and I do work with Cordio East Africa. A bit about the background of this work uh, is that Mesophotic Coral Ecosystem, MCE, which refer to coral ecosystem found in the depths ranging from 30 to 150 are some of the under-researched ecosystem in the Western Indian Ocean region. A review of the number of MCE studies around the world has shown that the studies of MCE in the wire region dwarf those in the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. And I think the main reason for all these is because of the high ship-based cost, logistical and capacity challenges. 
In the recent times, there has been advancement in technology and innovation leading to the development of unmanned vehicles to overcome these challenges. For instance, the autonomous underwater vehicle like Gavia has the ability to survey deeper environments reaching up to 500 meters, can provide high resolution uh, data of the seabed properties, resolution of up to 0.1 meters, and can collect a wide range of data on bathymetry, backscatter, benthic communities, and oceanography, including uh, conductivity, temperature, and dissolved oxygen. This then brings me to the question of why should we be concerned about MCEs? MCEs do provide refuge or against high sea surface temperature and fishing pressure. Indeed, evidence of depth refuge effect has been found in at Sanon Kori fisheries of the Zanzibar archipelago, including the two islands of Pemba and Unguja. Yet, the conservation of relatively deeper environments still remains unclear. So this is onto the motivation of this site. The model data shown here demonstrates how cool region of water visible in the lee side of Pemba Island, identifiable by cooler blue colors, uh, moves over time. The left plot is looking down on the island and Pemba Channel and cycles through one month of model simulation of the sea surface temperature. I'll just play it again. The right plot shows the same simulation, but as a slice through the black horizontal line shown on the left. There is a lot of variability, but it is evident that the model predicts regular transport or upwelling of deeper cool water to the surface. The same process is assumed to be a controlling mechanism in providing nutrient-rich deep water to the surface and water close to Pemba Island, which helps fuel productivity, especially for the small pelagics. Now on to the missions that were conducted in this area. The first unmanned vehicle I will talk about is a Gavia nicknamed Freya. It is considered a low logistic modular vehicle. The different modules as seen here can be replaced in minutes, allowing rapid sensor reconfiguration and battery replacement. The Gavia was deployed from a wooden research vessel, RV Angra Pequena, and covered about 75 kilometers and 13 hours of survey in three days. In case you want uh, details about this survey, you can scan this uh, QR code to take you to the study. It was deployed at four selected sites with three, uh, West Misali, South Misali and Kwani being southwest of Pemba Island and one convenient site, Tumbatu Shoal located northwest of Mbuja Island. And this one here. The AUV was operated in three modes. The first mode was for seafloor mapping, where the AUV was programmed to fly 10 meters above sea level, like missions two, five, and 10. The second mode was for detailed seabed photography, where the AUV flew two meters above seafloor, like missions four and seven. The last mode was for oceanographic survey, where the AUV was programmed to fly at variable depths from five to 150, like mission three. Two of our mission, eight and nine, were aborted due to rough sea conditions, and that's why we had to select a convenient site of Tumbatu as a replacement um, survey site. These are just the pictures to depict the deployment, data retrieval, and celebration after successful deployment. And now into the results we were able to derive high resolution data of seafloor properties, which should support management and conservation planning of the Pemba Channel seascape. The grayscale figure on the left shows acoustic back scatter. The color scale figure shows the bathymetry with warm colors depicting shallower uh, areas while cooler blue colors 
showing deeper areas. It is clear that there is an abrupt change in depth at around 50 and also 90 meters depth, as is shown in the visualization in the right. The bathymetric profile using a line plot, this one here, highlights that the West Missali has a complex seafloor with submarine walls. And indeed, these walls are critical in maintaining the high biodiversity. AUV are able to provide photographs of the substrata and habitats. Like seen in this uh, photo here, which is a mosaic image of pockmark or depression measuring five meters wide and three meters deep, photographed at 22 meters, wa uh, meters of water depth in Kohani area. We found these pockmarks were widespread and likely to be of fluid escape origin than by rational. We also documented healthy hard corals as in photograph B, tough and fleshy algae, uh, at 23 meters, uh, photograph C, hard coral, uh, surgeon fish um, in photograph D, snapper, and octocorals in uh, uh, photograph F, and so on. Oceanographic data on temperature and oxygen collected by AUV showed least variation in the upper 100 meters implying that the upper 100 meters is well mixed. Data collected by the AUV can also be utilized to perform predictive modeling to determine areas you are likely to find particular substrata or components of the mesophotic coral ecosystem. For example, using generalized additive models, we found hard substrata shown by letters HA were more likely to be found in depths denoted by D of 30 meters and where slopes denoted by S were steep. As for corals shown by letter CO were more likely to be found in depths of 30 to 40 meters and in areas showing high backscatter denoted by B. The findings on depth provides evidence of existence of mesophotic coral ecosystem with an upper boundary at 30 to 40 meter, meters, similar to what has been observed elsewhere. Now onto the second fieldwork, uh, which used gliders. The survey was led by Matthew Palmer. Uh, the essential parameter measured included temperature, salinity, and ocean currents to understand the physical conditions nutrients and chlorophyll fluorescence to link nutrients to growth, and some indicator of fish abundance. We had available to this experiment two specialist type of glider, gliders, a nutrient sensor glider that used an autonomous lab on chip nitrate sensor developed by National Oceanographic Center, and a fisheries acoustic glider that had previously managed to, to measure large zoo plankton swarms. Unfortunately, the fisheries acoustic glider developed a leak, so only managed a few hours of operation in Pemba Channel. The remainder of parameters required fitting out a local sports fishing boat, Huntress, with a MET package for wind and light, a high resolution uh, GPS system, a vessel mounted ADCP to measure currents down to 500 meters, and an eco sounder to assist navigation and to help find areas of high fish abundance. If you're interested with um, how these missions were conducted, you can scan this QR code, which will take you to that study. Uh, these are just photographs of the missions by glider showcasing the vessel that was used, um, the deployment process and uh, uh, how the chemical engineers were preparing the chemical lab on chip sensor before deployment. Now onto the results. The data shown here are observation of temperature, salinity, chlorophyll A fluorescence, 
and nitrate concentration collected by the glider in the lee side of Pemba Island near the steep slope of the island. You can see the path the glider took on the map on the right here. You, as you can see from the panels on the left, we observed a strong vertical temperature gradient and noticed distinct layer of high salinity water between a depth of 100 to 200 meters. The profile in the bottom right corner confirmed our early assumption that nutrient concentrations were low in the surface waters and high at, in, in deeper waters. We can see from looking at these two plots that the high salinity layer is at the same depth as the gradient between low and high nitrate concentration. Above, above this high salinity layer, we observe instances of increased chlorophyll A, which is an indicator for phytoplankton biomass. In contrary to our early assumption of a generally northward flowing current at all depths, we find that there is a southward flowing current directly below the northward flowing East African coastal current at the surface. The top plot shows opposing currents where blue is the northward and the red is the southward. We note that this southward current is associated with enhanced salinity core at a depth between 100 and 200 meters. The shear created by the two opposing current likely leads to enhanced ocean mixing, which you can see in the bottom left panel shown in red colors. This suggests that mixing due to enhanced shear caused by the opposing currents near the steep slopes of the lee of the Pemba Channel are likely the dominant mechanism to flux nutrients to the light lead layer of the ocean and support primary productivity. Now onto uh, some of the policy me uh, messages that can be drawn from these robotic studies include the following. One, there's need to build awareness of the existence of mesoportical ecosystem and the importance as depth the refugia. And this will, will, will need engaging the stakeholders on the need to extend conservation areas to include mesoportic depths and uh, drop-offs. There's also need to invest in low-cost marine robotics and as technology advances, uh, these are likely to become cheaper. And there's also need to amend fisheries and conservation policy to include mesophotic coral ecosystem in management plans. As we found pockmarks widely distributed in these areas, there's also need to conduct studies on the distribution and uh, origin of pockmarks. Detailed monitoring across mesophotic depths range are needed and assessment of the threats facing them should also be conducted. That brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. In case you have any questions, you can uh, write to me using the emails provided there. Thank you very much. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Kennedy. Um, so we're gonna have a presentation next from Matt Palmer. Um, and then after that, we'll have time for some questions. If you do have any questions, if you would like to type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, but for now, I'll pass over to Matt, who's doing a presentation entitled Enhancing Western Indian Ocean Readiness for Marine Robots. Thanks, Amani. Um, if you can just confirm, you can see my slides again. Yep, I can see those. Okay. Uh, thanks uh, for some excellent introductions to this work, really, actually, in the previous talks. Um, so, my name is Matthew Palmer. I'm the Chief Scientist of uh, Marine Autonomous and Robotic Systems at the UK National Oceanography Centre. 
And today I'm presenting some outcomes of a study into the readiness or the perceived readiness, I suppose, of the Western Indian Ocean research community to use marine robots, such as the ones Kennedy's just talked about, uh, for future ocean research. This work was undertaken with an international team as part of the uh, Associates GCRF uh, program, which of course is what this webinar is part of. Work out the technicalities of driving. Um, so we often see global ocean observing strategies that typically um, include access to a broad range of state-of-the-art oceanographic uh, and satellite equipment, ships, labs, support staff. They might include public private partnerships and a dense community of science and technology expertise uh, and skills that enables quick delivery and, and open access um, oh, sorry, quick, uh, quick delivery of open access and interoperable data. But while many des what might be termed desktop state-of-the-art technologies such as uh, satellite observation data and ocean model data have enabled great strides in the Western Indian Ocean region uh, to be taken in terms of its oceanographic capability, in terms of its in-situ measurements, which might be considered, continue to be the cornerstone of ocean science, such as physical, chemical, biological parameters, that remains, uh, unfortunately, uh, quite poorly resolved. So conventionally, such measurements are collected by research ships and regionally, though, uh, within the Western Indian Ocean, only South Africa and uh, Kenya, I believe, have owned such vehicles, uh, vessels, sorry. And visits by foreign owned vessels or ships of opportunity are, are typically far, few and far between. Elsewhere, however, marine robots are starting to change the way we conduct marine research. And you've just got to look at this uh, sort of uh, cartoon, really, as a goose cartoon, but you won't see these nowadays without the inclusion of lots of shiny yellow robots. Um, so we only, and we only have to look at the Argo programme to see the potential of that truly global oceanographic perspective that benefits both wealthy and low-income uh, coastal states. So with rapid adoption of marine robots elsewhere, this study aimed to test the readiness of the Western Indian Ocean for such such technologies. So I'm not going to spend a long time talking about the robotics missions themselves. You've already heard really good presentations um, around those and the more general um, discussion about sort of some of the ways we went to deliver that. Um, so I think, um, but I'd encourage you to also go back to look at some previous talks in this webinar series that could dig into some of the more scientific and technical details. So this study it's instead will examine the community engagement cost benefit analysis and the capacity development aspects of this case study to help assess um, the readiness and usefulness of marine robot technologies uh, in the Western Indian Ocean region. So this slide does just uh, quickly provide a little bit of background if you've missed previous talks to the missions themselves. And in order um, to actually get these things uh, actually operating, already took a significant amount of engagement with uh, regional partners and also included, of course, the uh, participation of uh, those partners with, uh, who joined UK researchers and technologists uh, to deliver a mo uh, multiple marine robots uh, missions to deliver the overarching uh, mission aim, which was itself um, developed through um, quite an intensive and extensive uh, uh, community engagement programme that included uh, co regional coastal communities, NGOs, uh, Tanzanian uh, national and regional coastal resource managers and marine policy makers. Uh, the missions themselves required using local resources and infrastructure as well as the skills and knowledge of local marine experts to undertake what was a series of complex missions in extremely hazardous waters that were continually fast, fast flowing, deep and remote from many of the large infrastructure support that uh, might be typical for the visiting UK partners. Uh, one element of this was the local um, and regionally sourced uh, boats and crews that were required uh, to manage this deep, both deep and shallow uh, water requirements of these missions. Uh, the shallower aspects of the missions, um, as the talk previous to this from Kennedy um, started with, discussed um, typically less than 100 metres or so, were managed by a uh, propeller driven AUV, uh, which had high levels of capacity, which included things like side scan sonar. Uh, quite, which required quite a lot of uh, energy density uh, and benthic habitat mapping to be undertaken. The deeper elements were undertaken within extremely fast flowing waters. And this, this was done with uh, gliders. And there's a series of pictures of 
uh, both gliders and the AUVs on the sides in front of you there. Um, the, but the gliders almost acted like floats, uh, almost controllable floats that were uh, followed the incoming flows as they swept into the Pemba Channel, recording data down to some deep depths, many hundreds of meters, and then were picked up on a daily basis. So critical to the mission's success was adequate engagement and acceptance of those people that were actually actively using those local coasts and sea regions that the mission was operating. So as mentioned, uh, during the planning stages, the Solstice uh, project team undertook a comprehensive engagement program with workshops in Nguja to understand regional requirements and develop mission objectives. But ahead of and during the robotics missions, uh, we also provided a locally focused engagement program um, which directly engage with coastal fishing communities that might come in um, that might come into contact with the robots while they're either while they're fishing or if they might become washed up on the shore. Uh, the engagement included providing information by discussion of planned operations, uh, using educational videos that explain the mission's uh, objectives and introduce the technologies. Educational leaflets, and there's an example on the screen in a moment, uh, were also produced uh, in a local Sahili language to help explain uh, what to do should anyone encounter the robots. And to assess the effectiveness of engagement, a survey was undertaken that asked fishers a range of questions before and after they'd seen this education material. And that survey included um, such questions as whether fishers believe the robots were results of those missions might be benefit themselves or their families, uh, whether they believe they might provide useful or valuable information, and also um, some more simple questions around what they might do if they came across the robots themselves. After the robot, we saw a um, significant uplift in the benefits, uh, the perceived benefits of those missions and the technologies. Um, so um, those fishers believing there would be it would be beneficial to themselves personally, rising to some 50%. Um, whereas when you actually consider that at a community level, some 78% of fishers believe that the technologies and, and the missions objectives would actually benefit their communities and all fishers accepted that actually at a national level it would be beneficial. So at a more practical level, when asked what people uh, might do if they discovered the robot on the sea or in, um, in the sea rather or on the beach, there was, there was an increase in numbers that would leave it alone and that were willing to then report it to authorities, as was being instructed in the video and leaflets and something that we didn't identify as an immediate response when we initially took on that, uh, conducted that sir. So our next assessment, and I apologise for the busyness of the screen and, and certainly wouldn't um, expect you to read through this too much, I'll try and summarise. Uh, but a score matrix was developed to try and assess the costs, risks and benefits of different elements of delivering the marine robotic uh, missions. Areas covered included uh, the provision and costs of associated with providing the uh, robots or AUVs from the UK partners, the logistics associated with those missions, the provision of expertise, the general running costs and including those consumables and the communications that are required and costs associated with those support boats and finally the um, uh, processing and analysis of data that was, uh, that was collected. Well since each of the uh, robotics were, uh, robots used in the mission were provided from the UK much of the cost and risk, risk was naturally associated then with the, um, with the provision and transport costs of those assets and the accompanying specialist technical support. The perceived benefits of the marine robots themselves to coastal ocean research in the region were perceived as high, but also perceived it coming at um, providing some level of risk or disadvantage um, and at relatively high cost. The dependency on services provided by international partners presented high reward through the direct provision of state-of-the-art equipment and highly trained and experienced personnel. personnel. However, it was also deemed too costly at the national and institutional levels West Indian Ocean partners. While the use of external equipment and services was also considered to be of high value, it was perceived to limit investment in local and regional skills and infrastructure with the funds from the project obviously then going to have to support those otherwise high costs. And therefore it's perceived to also potentially limit regional capacity development that might otherwise uh, deliver future missions with marine robots. The need for additional ship and boat support also highlighted a lack of local capacity that would be a major hindrance for future studies of this type uh, regionally. Um, but solutions were found um, 
from regional commercial and NGO partners. But again, uh, both instances were deemed currently beyond the funding capability of institutional and marine uh, research budgets, national marine research budgets. Sorry. So again, another busy slide, uh, but I'll provide a link through to the paper that goes into all this analysis and surveys in more detail later. But to try and assess the capacity of development attributable to any one project is inherently difficult since the development of skills and knowledge, uh, as well as the availability and investment in associated infrastructure is not ever managed in isolation. So each of the institutes and individuals that participate in the robotics field work uh, also conduct a range of ongoing marine research activities and pursue multiple funding opportunities with multiple national and international partners throughout the time frame of the Solstice project. And so consideration must be made also for the overlapping interests and associated capacity development that goes on. So within this context, a simple approach was taken of self-assessment um, to try and capture that perceived capacity development within four of the partner institutes that are engaged with the uh, robotics programme. That included uh, IMS, uh, Comfrey, Tafiri, and NMU. So while it doesn't provide an explicit assessment of that capacity development attributed to the project, it does provide an assessment of perceived capacity and opportunities for marine re robots at the organisational, national, and international frameworks. So to try and help your eyes a little bit there, because it's a dense slide, I've just um, zoomed in here on one of those capacity development categories, uh, so you can see some of the level of detail. Um, the assessment matrix was produced in consultation with project partners and included five level, levels of capacity from a low baseline level. In this instance, an example where no skills were available to process data through to aspirational levels of capacity and opportunity. And again, to use this example, um, broad skill, skill, skill set of eight are available, competent skills, the ability to process and uh, analyze and interpret new observations, etc. Scores of one to five were provided from principal investigators or PIs from each partner institute at the beginning of the project, prior to the marine robot focus workshops and field work being undertaken. And then scores were updated some 12 months after completion of all field work uh, to identify the, um, the changes in perceived capacity within the timeframe of the project. Uh, the capacity and disciplinary focus of um, an expertise within each institute, however, was quite varied. And so to try and help calibrate those scores for PIs, um, an example response was at that um, was provided at midpoint, and that's in the far right of that example uh, of a score of three. So to look at the results uh, from that capacity development matrix, uh, here you can see the scores from each of the four institutes um, surveyed both at the before and after, as mentioned previously. Again, quite a dense slide, but I'll try and run through um, provide some explanation. Uh, this was expected. I'm um, sorry. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, so the capacity development scores from the four institutes surveyed at the beginning of the project identified a varied level of experience, confidence and access to marine robots. And that's to be expected given that very different level of expertise and experience within each, particularly related to marine robotics. So responses after the field work and data processing have taken place have been um, suggests a marked increase in capacity within each of the four partner institutes, which is great news. Each perceived an average increase across the five provided categories of at least one level, with NMU perceiving a higher, uh, notably higher average of some two capacity levels. But of course, these average scores are not evenly represented across different categories, so are only used as a guide and shouldn't be used in quantifying um, sense. And there's quite a lot of dense information in there that we pick out a few examples from, but I won't go through each. But for instance, in terms of the um, Perceived increase in capacity uh, of, of within institutes for data processing and analysis. We saw um, an uplift in, um, of, on average, of around, um, close to one, uh, one capacity development point. While none of the partners have prior experience using marine robots or processing, analysis, um, processing, analyzing, or managing this data, confidence in meeting likely processing analysis requirements associated with marine robots vary greatly, ranging from some that was one to four, and only incremental improvements in this case were reported in that perceived capacity. If we have a look at um, further to the right of that um, uh, uh, matrix, uh, if we look at the recognition of funding at the, at the national level, 
we see a market um, mark increase in each at each institute which at least identifies that while um, that at that sort of national funding level, there is at least recognition of a, um, um, an availability, potential availability of funding uh, within this area. So an incredibly dense amount of information there, and I, I apologize for trying to squeeze quite a lot of it into this short, um, short talk. But all the information is available on the paper reference at the bottom of this screen, uh, recently published as part of a special issue around this project. And that's free and open access to anyone. But if you have difficulties, please do uh, contact me directly. So this study demonstrates that marine robots offer significant potential for Western Indian Ocean states to meet national coastal ocean research objectives and will help them contribute to international marine science programs. The introduction of those robotic technologies to uh, regional researchers and coastal communities within this project has increased the capacity and readiness for regional adoption. Costs for such equipment are still, however, too high for any immediate adoption. Next steps will require further investment and commitment at both national and regional levels. And this study recommends considering scalable options that may provide incentives for progressive funding rather than immediate investment in expensive capital infrastructure. At regional levels, providing accessible opportunities for skills development through training and facilitating international collaborations would build on the capacity development that's already been achieved within the project and through other initiatives. Enabling a regional host facility or center of excellence for uh, marine robots where sufficient skills, facilities and experience might exist to host collaborative future international partnerships would certainly provide a key route to attracting future funding and, and further international partners. And whilst, while supporting also further regional uh, capacity development. As has already been mentioned in this series, the emerging availability also of smaller, cheaper marine robots may also provide one accessible way to continue to develop some of these skills and develop that, um, continue to develop confidence and reputation around what has already been achieved here. And further investment in local skills and su support facilities would also help promote local buying and like to reduce cost and risk while feeding further into regional capacity and benefits for future marine research activity. Uh, so thank you for your time. Uh, again, I've just put, dropped the um, reference there and uh, I'd encourage anyone to go and look at the papers also within that special issue. Thanks. Hey, thanks Matt. So hopefully those set of talks have given a really good overview of um, of marine robots and the work that we've done using them within Solstice. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Julianne now, and she's going to host uh, the Q and A session. If you have some questions, if you put them in the chat, or um, you should be able to also raise your hand, and we can allow you to speak if you would like to ask a question that way. Great, thanks very much, Amani, and thanks again to our three speakers um, for your very interesting talks and to mostly keeping to time. Um, at the moment, I don't see any uh, questions in the Q&A box, um, but I've got a couple of questions for our speakers. Uh, I think, Kennedy, for you first, um, uh, it's quite impressive how, uh, what detail you can see from the Saxon scan sonar from the um, Gavia that you used um, from West Masali, those really steep slopes. Um, but you did mention that uh, so far, there hasn't been a lot of research being done in the Western Indian Ocean, and you think that's because of um, the costs associated with ship surveys. Um, so, do you, but do you think that the current capabilities of marine robots are as good as traditional ship surveys? Yeah, I think they are. I would say. Um, the, the amount of effort required to do surveys in the, of the deep environment is quite large, uh, but marine robots do offer a slightly uh, cheaper option uh, to do the surveys with um, uh, limited um, capacity or with limited staff uh, compared, let's say, with ship based. Of course, there would need to be like uh, more capacity uh, development for people to be well avast with the knowledge of using marine robots. But I guess with time, once they, uh, ask, they have uh, adequate skills, then they are able to 
conduct those surveys with few people. So like uh, the Gavia, I believe um, if you have uh, maybe four or five staff, you can do the deployment once you're well equipped. But if it's ship based, uh, I think it requires a lot of um, effort, uh, not only uh, with the cost of equipment, but also the ship time cost, which is quite high. Okay, great. And so to follow on from that, um, <clears throat> you suggested in your policy recommendations that uh, it's really important to engage stakeholders appropriately to um, uh, particularly about the extension of conservation areas. So do you think that uh, now that we have more marine uh, robots available, do you think they will help engage with stakeholders to, um, to extend those conservation areas? Do you think these are effective tools for that? Yes, I do. <clears throat> One thing is, um, if you look at the way marine protected areas have been assigned previously in the Western Indian Ocean, is that they, have, they did not take into account the deep environments and that because there was not enough data of the deep environments. Uh, and what you don't know, you don't protect or you don't uh, put any effort to it. So there's need, first of all, to en engage by highlighting, first of all, the existence of these environments. Once that is known through education and awareness, then you can start um, maybe changing policies to make sure that uh, things such as mesophotic or ecosystems are included in management plans uh, or any fisheries or um, conservation policies. And with that, they have a place in legislation and then it becomes quite easy to protect or uh, do any research on them. Great, sounds like a really good plan. Uh, now, uh, coming on to Matthew, um, you were saying that um, marine robots are now uh, have a firm place in global ocean observing strategies and um, <clears throat> you did mention a couple of kind of broader things uh, in you said that you could uh, do to improve marine robots but so what do you personally see as kind of the best one of one of the most uh, efficient or best developments in the next five or ten years is it mostly cost driven or is it uh, durability or more sensors uh Thanks, Julian. Um, it's a good question. I mean, if we actually look at, often with the this type of robotic instrumentation, we often look to Argo uh, for quite a few answers because that is a global community. There's a lot of global buy-in and everyone benefits. But that's largely because of the, Lagra the Lagrangian nature of these things. You throw them in the ocean, you've got no control over where it's going to go. It therefore feeds into everyone's everyone's back, um, you know, backyard space. I think gliders, and the, the robots that Kennedy uh, has been involved with as well, the prop driven AUVs, are a little bit more targeted. And that's why they're quite useful in the coastal ocean environment. So we, I don't think we quite got the framework in mind yet to allow open access to that type of technology. They are still expensive. These things can cost $100,000, typically hundreds of thousand dollars, um, you know, for um, extremely capable versions. So we do need to consider how actually we can make, you know, uh, the, make them accessible to everyone and others, not just the most wealthy of um, coastal states. So I think there is there is some um, really good effort going on around the Goose program um, to try and provide some international focus to how we might best use uh, that, that collective capability. Within the European framework, there's similar, similar types of work. And I think one of the recommendations um, that we came to in that uh, paper I highlighted was that a regional hub still seem, seems to be a very good option in that space, but that does require what is always very difficult because it's political, is actually that sort of joined up regional funding and then making those very tricky decisions about where those hubs might actually sit, you know, whether that's a benefit because those hubs might attract funding, but they also might provide quite significant burden. The next, the other way to approach this, of course, is what's also been mentioned both by myself and Kennedy this morning, is around those smaller, um, potentially cheaper uh, technologies. We do start seeing some smaller robotics that might not be as capable as the types that have been talked about today, but at least get us some of the way there. And, and as technology improves, battery technology improves, as well as the sensor capability, um, that could that could provide a, a really good stepping stone, I think, towards that. The great thing there as well, of course, is because it, 
they might not require the same level of infrastructure support, but people can start developing some of the you know, capacity developments maintained uh, and skills are developed and it attracts, uh, includes um, regional partners in part of that global discussion around where marine robotics needs to go. I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you. Uh, hand back to Amani now. Hey, thanks for those talks and really interesting discussion there. Um, so we're going to take a short break now, just for five minutes, and then we'll come back with some talks about um, modelling and remote sensing and, and their use um, in, in Solstice. So uh, we'll be back at 10 past 12 after a short break. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, we're a little bit over time, so I will try to make this presentation brief. And I just, uh, just wanted in this presentation to share some thoughts and some summaries of our approach to modeling we took in uh, Solstice on uh, modeling approach to upwelling systems on and also on importance of social economics. Uh, first of all, uh, just to remind that uh, Solstice is a, a project which is endorsed by IOE2. And what you see on the screen is a map put together, I believe, by Mike Roberts as part of IOE2 Western Indian Ocean Upwelling Research Initiative, Viore. So I think after four years of solstice, we can add a lot to this map, which shows key upwelling, upwelling systems uh, of the Western Indian Ocean. So uh, I think what is coming from solstice is the need to look at the seasonal upwelling systems as socio-ecological systems. And that they are sitting uh, together between open ocean and coastal driven mechanisms. So there are multiple mechanisms sustaining those systems as there are always some, something very peculiar, very unique about topography and kind of more coastal winds, but predominantly they're driven by the open ocean. And when we're looking at those systems, we really shouldn't stop at uh, ocean dynamics and biogeochemistry. We need to look further into marine ecosystems they're sustaining, into fisheries, which are supported by those ecosystems, and coastal communities, especially in the global tropics, where those uh, seasonal upwelling systems support uh, artisanal and small industrial fisheries, which are critical to the food security of these local populations. And right now there is quite a uh, huge decisions are made at country scales on investment into blue economies based on our understanding of uh, those, how those system functioning, uh, very often very imperfect understanding. And also decisions are being made on climate change adaptation options. Again, on the basis of our very limited understanding of how this system will evolve. But that is critically important because those upwelling systems, they're at frontiers of the climate change impact. They are windows into the deep oceans. And so ocean acidification and the oxygenations will manifest themselves first in those systems. And also those upwelling systems really very clearly demonstrate the key challenge with UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, mainly the indivisibility. So it's not just SDG 14, life underwater we're addressing here, we're addressing trade-offs between SDG 14 and, for example, one and two, uh, no poverty and zero hunger. Actually, in fact, uh, there are 15 out of 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals are involved in the development of this upwelling system, sustainable development of these upwelling systems. So uh, what we had in Solstice, just briefly to summarize, 
we had a Wellington the North Kenyan Bank, which is seen by Kenyan government as the next frontier of food security, and also as a climate change adaptation option uh, with coral reefs being degraded and overfished and now at risk from climate change. That move towards deeper fisheries is uh, one of the options for climate change adaptation. In South Africa, collapse of the Chokak squid fishery again, a dwelling driven fishery, um, most likely uh, resulted as a, as a consequence of uh, anomalous functioning of the Gulas Bank of dwelling. In Tanzania, looking at the small pelagic, again, a dwelling driven fishery. And now we added the fourth case study uh, with uh, World Bank on the future of the Somali upwelling, the largest upwelling on ours. So the approach we took in solstice is to use existing global high resolution models in conjunctions with remote sensing. So there are a series of papers led by Zoe Jacobs in collaboration with Fatma Jebri on modeling of you know, uh, North Kenyan bank, uh, Tanzanian and Kenyan filling system, although we were not as successful with the Tanzanian filling system because even higher resolution is needed than one twelve to get that Pemba uh, channel upwelling properly. But at least we had a good, uh, good attempt to analyze it. And we used climate projections at one quarter degree resolution under RCP 8.5 scenarios. Again, existing ocean projections. Uh, in Agulas Bank, we coupled our models with spectrum models, an effort led by Plymouth Marine Laboratory by John Bragman, and in Kenyan Tanzania, coupled with uh, size spectrum dynamic biogeochemical envelope model with Simrin Saleh and uh, uh, Rob Wilson. So, uh, and that's again to summarize, that was our approach use existing model, don't try to develop a very high resolution regional one because that takes months, sometimes years to develop, set up, and test properly. And that was probably one of our biggest challenges with capacity development in this area. Even using existing models take lots of technical skills. I think we succeeded most with South Africa, where climate change impact was analyzed uh, from existing climate change projections uh, by Sarah as the South African students. We were not as successful with individual skills in Kenya and Tanzania, but I believe we've done a lot of achieve a lot of progress in developing organizational skills and skills of other research and well, uh, working in collaboration with modelers and using model output in the in the uh, African led papers in collaboration with our scientists. So just uh, to highlight um, one of the, I think, most interesting outputs where we managed to uh, show a direct link between a physical and biogeochemical processes and uh, fisheries, uh, that's uh, Fatma's Jebri paper showing direct impact of the strands of uh, South in monsoon on catches of small pelagic fisheries in Tanzania. So another one, uh, one on the North Kenyan bank, uh, led by Zoe Jacobs and Fatma Jebri, again, on the really interesting behavior of North Kenyan bank ecosystems, uh, upwelling and ecosystems. So it's a tricky upwelling which tends to move around, doesn't sit still, and that particular paper Look at the El Nino, where during this really interesting year, this upwelling moved from EZ of Kenya into EZ of Tanzania, which led to uh, which led to highest catches of uh, high, highest landing in Tanzania and very low landings in Kenya. 
So, uh, yeah, that is an incredibly interesting upwelling. Uh, you often see it in the news, tons of tuna fish are out in Lamu due to lack of market. That usually happens in February in years of particularly strong upwelling. And there was even a very interesting uh, little study which Fatma Jebri done in real time to analyze what's going on with unusually high catches uh, reported in Kenya uh, with very anomalously strong upwelling in uh, 2020. And just to briefly highlight that uh, we did a study on a very, very late in solstice project. We've done a new study, the fourth uh, case study on Somalia upwelling system on request of the World Bank to uh, underpin the future strategy on investment into fisheries infrastructure there. That is a study which is uh, Zoe Jacobs and Fatma Jebri are now beginning to summarize and uh, getting it ready for the publication. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, please wear up and I will stop sharing the screen. Thanks, Katja. Yeah, once again, if anyone has any questions, if you could type them into the Q&A box and we will take them um, after the next two talks, then we'll have time for some more questions. Um, unfortunately, Fatma hasn't been able to join us today, um, but she has sent me her presentation, so um, I will play it for you just now. Um, it's about uh, machine, using machine learning and remote sensing to investigate the influence of the Agulis current on the um, Agulis bank photoplankton. So I'll just play that um, video now. Hi, I'm Dr. Fatma Jebri from the National Oceanography Center, and I'll be presenting how we use machine learning and Earth observation to study surface current influences on seasonal upwelling productivity over the Agulhas Bank. The South African Agulhas region is dominated by the Agulhas current, which affects and is influenced by the hydrography of the Agulhas Bank, as sh shown within the boxed area on this figure. But it is unclear what are the Agulhas current different variability modes or topologies that influence phytoplankton availability during the cold rich season, so that would be November to March, and how they vary interannually. To answer this, we used machine learning and earth observation, since earth observation inform on environmental conditions in almost synoptic way, while machine learning allows to reduce the large dimensionality of satellite data identify relationships among this data and remove unstructured noise. But first, what is machine learning? Put in simple words, machine learning is about trying to mimic how the human brain operates because the human brain is one of the most powerful tools for learning. So the human brain has about 100 billion neurons and each neuron is connected to a thousand of its neighbors. To recreate this digitally, an artificial structure is built holding a neural network composed of nodes or neurons. Some neurons will receive input values, so these are values that are known with the purpose of being analyzed, and that's called the input layer. Then there is the output value we want to predict, and that makes up the output layer. In between lay hidden layers where neuron synapses or connections are formed. So that is what machine learning is about in a very abstract level. Here we applied an unsupervised machine learning approach to the neural clustering self-organizing maps, so-called SOM, to 24 years of satellite currents, sea surface temperature, and chlorophyll A, which is a proxy of phytoplankton biomass and productivity. The functioning of the SOM is summarized in this chart. So the input layer takes the three-dimensional satellite uh, data concatenated into a row vector, and the output layer is composed of a two-dimensional map. Here, the size is three by four, 
so leading to 12 neurons. And each neuron has a weight vector, which is modified during the iterative training process called self-organizing. And when a winning neuron is found, its weight vectors and neighboring neurons are updated. The sum final outputs are reshaped back into 2D images. Moving on to the analysis of the SOM results, the 12 characteristic uh, SST and surface current patterns, so P1 to 12, over the Agulhas area of interest during November to March 1997-2020s are shown on this figure. A schematic of the current's direction for the 12 SOM patterns is superimposed. Note also that the percentage between parentheses represent the frequency of occurrence of each pattern during the 24 years time period. And based on the main AC topology represented here with the solid black arrows, these patterns can be grouped into four variability modes. An AC flowing southward along the topography or the shelf edge, and that's the most dominant mode, so that would concern P1 to 4, and P7 to 8, P and P10 to 11. The second most frequent mode is the AC with a cyclonic meander near shelf, so that would concern pattern P9 and P12. Then the, we have the AC early reflection represented here by pattern 5, and the AC with a cyclonic meander off shelf and those are the least frequent with a, fr uh, a frequency of occurrence of uh, 2.4% uh, and 3.05% uh, for P5 and P6 respectively. From the 12 characteristic chlorophyll A patterns, P1 to 12 derived from the SOM, the AC4 modes appear to influence the circulation and phytoplankton productivity on the shelf. Strong cold uh, ridge upwelling is detected in the AC uh, retroflexion mode, so that would be pattern P5, the AC with a cyclonic meander near shelf mode, P9 and 12, and half of the AC along the shelf edge pattern, P2 to 3, and P7 to 8. These more productive patterns are uh, generally associated with a strong southwestward flow over the central bank caused by the intrusion of the AC from the east bank or um, an anticyclonic meander uh, such as in P5. Less pronounced cold ridge upwelling is seen um, in the AC with a cyclonic meander off shelf mode, so that would be pattern six, and in the remaining patterns of the AC along the shelf edge mode, pattern one to four and pattern 10 to 11. And these situations can be related to a weaker southwest flow over uh, the um, central bank, as in P6, a strong uh, northeast flow on the east bank, uh, such as in P1 and P4, and, uh, and or to a stronger northwest flow uh, on the central bank, so that would be, pattern, for example, in pattern 11, which might hinder the extension of the cold ridge further to the southwest. Moving on to the time evolution of these AC patterns, they show a well-marked year-to-year viability as shown uh, on the top time series here, which represent the daily evolution of these 12 patterns during all November to March 1997-2020. And from this time series, we can see a typical pattern sequence, such as in 2016-17 and other anomalous events, such as 2000-2001. Uh, in typical conditions, only the AC along the shelf edge mode is, uh, is present, and we only see uh, patterns 1 to 4 and pattern 7 to 8, pattern 10 to 11, as the example here of to, uh, November to March 2016-17. The anomalous unusual pattern sequences, such as November, March 2000-2001, they show less frequent and fewer patterns than a typical season here, for uh, our example, there is only four patterns. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. So to conclude, the extracted 12 patterns from the SOM showed four topology of the AC system over the study area. The dominant AC along the, uh, the topography mode, confirming the well-known AC flowing southwestward. The second most frequent mode is the AC with a cyclonic meander near shelf 
And finally, the AC route reflection in AC with the cyclonic meander off shelf modes, which are found to be the less frequent. Those AC4 modes appear to influence the circulation and the phytoplankton productivity on the shelf. Strong cold ridge upwelling um, is found generally associated with a strong southwest flow over the central bank caused by the intrusion of the AC from the east bank or via an anticyclonic meander, such as in P5 as a result from the arterial deflection, and less pronounced cold ridge upwelling is found related to a weaker southwest flow over the central bank, strong northeast flow on the east bank, and or to stronger northwest flow on the central bank, which might hinder the extension of the cold ridge further to the southwest. The extracted wealth patterns show well-marked uh, year-to-year variability. The typical pattern trajectory is slowly composed of the AC along the shelf edge mode and the most anomalous or unusual pattern sequences such as November 2000-2001 show less frequent and fewer patterns than a typical season. This machine learning analysis can be applied to other oceanic regions or at a global scale and extended to other data sets, including modeling outputs and future climate projections. This could lead to important implications for investment decision considering assessment of climate risk. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So <clears throat> thank you to um, Fatma for sending that in. Unfortunately, she can't, she can't be here today, but um, as she said at the end of her uh, talk, if you would like to email her, then she'd be happy to answer any questions by email. So next up today, and that's our final, our final talk, and um, before some questions and discussions, we have um, Anna Queros, um talking about preparing for climate change. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, well done for staying to the end. Um, so my talk will be about climate driven opportunities and challenges for the spatial use and management of Tanzania's marine environment. And as you can see, I've acknowledged uh, our authors here. It's been a real group effort um, led by Liz and I here at PML, but working with many of our partners um, in, in Tanzania as well as NOC. Sorry, it's taking a little bit of time, but I'm sure you'll catch up in a minute. So marine spatial planning um, and, the, and blue growth in Tanzania. Um, the blue economy refers to the sustainable use of the ocean uh, and its resources towards development. And it has a particular relevance in coastal areas of Tanzania, um, whilst, for instance, uh, in Zanzibar, it was about a third of uh, GDP in 2019. So whilst the blue economy uh, may represent a small proportion of GDP for Tanzania at the national level in certain areas, that amount is actually significant and it is thought to employ about 4 million people uh, across the country. Of special value uh, to the blue economy are artisanal sectors like fisheries and seaweed aquaculture. In addition to this, there is a growing momentum for conservation in Tanzania. For instance, the Refugi Mafia and Kilwa UNESCO Man and Biosphere proposal, which is expected to go in this spring and has been a long process, will designate a large area um, of the coastal uh, ocean in Tanzania. Um, and so management of these uh, relationships between different sectors are especially important in Tanzania at the moment. Well, and marine special planning is the process through which we can do that. And and how to balance um, that wanted uh, blue economy growth with um, conservation aims. Um, so it is a process through which we can set priorities in different areas, whilst we can balance the needs of different sectors. And therefore it's also a key mechanism to support the delivery of the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which is at the core of uh, Tanzania's marine strategy for 2050. Now, climate change represents a massive challenge to this delivery. Um, as we saw in previous presentations, for instance, from the work that has, uh, Zoe Jacobs published um, earlier this year, the climate change is expected to have significant effects in the coastal and offshore waters of Tanzania in the coming decades. And of particular concern are uh, marine heat waves. Um, some data there from si Simon Van Genep, one of our collaborators at Mercator Ocean. Um, 
And recent work by Rob and other colleagues here at PML earlier this year as well has shown that this is likely to have important effects on um, fisheries, which support a large proportion of those jobs of Tanzania's blue economy. So what we see there are projections for um, uh, the biomass index for key species of interest to Tanzania as well as Kenya. And you can see that um, as climate change, uh, this is considering only RCP 8.5, so a scenario of um, growing emissions uh, doubling from the current rates by mid-century. And you can see that alongside um, climate change, in, an increase um, in uh, fishing pressure represented there by the MSY um, may, may lead to, decline, to the decline of many important species at a national level. So the aim of this study was to try to identify climate resilience strategies to the spatial management of key sectors of Tanzania's blue economy. So balancing out um, both the impacts as well as the opportunities for seaweed harvesting, rain conservation and artisanal fisheries in Tanzania, whilst considering that, for instance, conservation also has a key role in supporting the tourism economy. So the approach was to use climate modeling, um, some of which was shown already today in Katia's presentation, um, that was um, in, in many instances in the world, this type of data has been previously identified as a key decision support tool that can enable the development of these climate smart strategies for marine spatial planning or MSP. However, the uptake um, in Europe, in, in Africa and around the world really remains low. And the reason for that is that we tend to analyze these data sets focusing on long-term um, horizons, which are not tangible uh, to industry consultations that are have to be undertaken and community consultations that have to be undertaken as part of the planning process, which tends to have much shorter uh, sectoral objectives. And because climate change is not always tangible, especially to local communities, for instance, um, stating that temperature will go up by one degree or that pH will go down by 0 0.3 units is often not something relatable. Um, and it is sometimes difficult to, to determine how that might impact specific sectors of interest to people and to industries. So we recently developed um, a method to, uh, with that specific focus of informing marine spatial planning processes uh, using climate modeling. And the idea is to consider not just um, what impacts climate change might have, but also um, what opportunities might emerge in the short term in, in, in temporal horizons that are amenable to, to the development of policy strategy and management strategies and focusing on specifically on what can be done. In addition to that, in terms of numerically speaking, it allows the attribution of climate change as the source um, when change is observed in, in the ecosystem, but it also identifies um, near-term and mid-term opportunities that arrive, for instance, from climate cycles. So it identifies not just what will be lost, but also what can be done in terms of you know, real-life sectoral management. And we focus not just on specific sectors like artisanal fisheries and conservation, but we also look more holistically at the ecosystem managed, managed and uh, look at uh, for those uh, sectoral synergies that lead to win-win scenarios for marine spatial planning. So in summary, what we do is we start with uh, state-of-the-art ocean climate modeling. In this case, we used uh, uh, Nemo Medusa outputs from the biogeochemical modeling uh, led by um, Zoe, which was published early this year, and also the uh, uh, mechanistic species distribution modeling led by the um, PML team. And then we select data layers that are of interest to describe each of those sectors, so seaweed harvesting, artisanal fisheries, and the marine conservation sector in Tanzania. And for each of those cases, each of those three cases, we then undertake a sector specific spatial random effects meta analysis of the modeling, which allows us to identify the emergence of the climate signal. And what we then do is in a spatially explicit manner and for specific timeframes, we then identify where are those very sensitive areas, so the climate change hotspots where the activities of specific sector will not be sustainable in the midterm. We look for the climate change refugia, so the areas where there is higher resilience of the natural ecosystem underpinning each of those sectors to climate change. So where activities might continue to take place more or less as they, as they are now. And we also look for the bright spots. So those places where because of climate cycles in the midterm, we might see a temporary improvement of habitat conditions that may support sectoral growth. So then we provide spatial maps that identify the distribution of those areas. So the very sensitive areas, as well as the, the resilient areas and the areas where opportunities may occur. 
and we overlay to that um, GIS data, so uh, geographical information uh, system data sets that explain, for instance, where fishing effort is distributed, where key habitats are distributed. And in this way, we then look for the um, within sector opportunities as well as the cross sector synergies. So giving now a quick uh, sneak peek at our results as this is work in progress. So the paper is not, is not finalized yet. Um, so for the conservation sector, what you see there are the results of the modeling analysis. And then um, in this case, you see the distribution of various sectors. So for example, the Bogomoyo port, which is being built, um, the purple, um, so you have the, the legend down here. So you see the um, prawn aquaculture sites and seaweed harvesting sites in green. And then you see the distribution of, of fishing efforts. Um, this is for the larger vessels, so taken from uh, Global Fishing Watch. And if we zoom in, then you can see that there are, um, then the background color is the actual uh, modeling analysis. So um, you have the, the oh, the legend's not showing, it's actually showing here. So the green areas are actually where we see the climate signal emerge and the black dot tells us where um, the system is actually entering a new state because of climate change pressures. And then the yellow areas are the opposite, so the opposite trends. And so what we see is that in, uh, in this analysis, which was for the mid-century, so the 2040s compared to the present decade and under this um, higher emission scenario than we see at present, we see that the coastal area is actually quite sensitive and that this affects not only various areas where we have important uh, eco uh, blue economy activities like seaweed harvesting, um, but also the protected areas, which in this case are particularly important. So you can see the purple lines here are protected sites but also the, those key habitats. So for instance, in orange, we see here the coral reefs, um, we, we see seagrass and mangrove areas, we see turtle nesting sites. So all of these coastal areas appear to be particularly sensitive to climate change in the next two decades, whilst the offshore areas seem to be uh, less sensitive. Looking then at the comparable results for the fishing analysis for the fishing sector. So now this is now looking at data from the dynamic bioclimate envelope model that Rob Wilson published earlier this year. You, we, what we found was that there was actually um, high sensitivity of some species. So for instance, some tuna species were very sensitive to climate change and that's the green color. Whilst some other species, so for instance, in this case, the sardinella, were actually um, not as affected by climate change. And when we looked at the compare this to um, the data that was published by Rob, what you see is that these lines here below the, the midline indicate the stocks that would uh, uh, fare less well under climate change. And the, the top lines are those that through compensatory mechanisms between these um, fish assemblages, we might actually see a potential increases in biomass. So what we found was that there was this pattern of some species being sensitive and some species being less sensitive. And that's, um, that was the pattern over most of the uh, Tanzanian EZ. Now, it is important to mention that um, this model, despite being sort of a high-end model uh, for these types of species, it does not include, for instance, the uh, forcing effect of heat waves on populations of fish or indeed their key habitats, which in many cases are uh, coral reefs. So um, these are more or less uh, very conservative estimates, we would say, uh, very conservative estimates. Um, and then we did similar analysis for the seaweed harvesting sector. And in this case, we focused on Zanzibar um, uh, and, uh, um, because, and Pemba, because these are areas where you can see here, there's high concentration of seaweed harvesting areas. And also um, it's important to mention that seaweed harvesting is a particularly socially important activity in Tanzania because it's primarily undertaken by women. And therefore um, it's a key uh, route out of poverty for many of these um, coastal communities. And what we found in this case is that this M giving the, the estimate of the climate signal is that there are indeed very strong climate trends in the region, but that um, uh, in this case, we did not see uh, the system entering a state um, outside of its current variability. So it, we did consider heat waves in this analysis and seaweed are particularly sensitive to heat waves, um, but uh, we could see that whilst we see a, a climate uh, trend, it is not indeed a climate signal. So the system remains more or less um, within uh, current variability. So these are main, main findings this far, and now we are working with our sort of, um, with our in-country partners to develop sort of the social interpretation of, and cultural interpretation of these data. But what we see, so under these RCP 8.5, so the higher emission scenario, we think that increase, increased emissions represent key challenges to Tanzania's blue econ economic growth and sustainable development. So one and two, so um, decreased poverty and uh, uh, redu uh, 
ending hunger, but also five, which is about gender parity, and of course, uh, SDG 14, which is about the life in the ocean. Um, inshore waters appear to be particularly sensitive to climate change, affecting uh, all of the assessed sectors. Um, and coral habitats and other related species seem to be especially at risk from higher emissions because of their location um, in terms across um, these spatial patterns. So we saw, based on our data, variable sensitivity of species targeted by the artisanal fishing sector. But again, this modeling does not account for the effects of heat waves on the demographics of fish species, or indeed the loss of coral, which has been observed already that um, coral species are particularly sensitive across the coast of Tanzania, where bleaching events have been recorded already. So the work in progress is indeed to continue working with our Tanzania-based colleagues to explore the sectoral and social implications of the modeling analysis. And our paper is in preparation, and we hope to have the first draft um, at the end of this month. Thanks very much. Thank you, Anna. Um, and you can, it's nice to see a, a preview of that work, um, and everyone can look out for that paper on the link that I sent earlier to the Solstice website. It will be up there once it's published. I'm going to hand over to Julianne now to handle any. Any questions? Once again, if you can put them in the Q&A or if you want to raise your hand, then we can allow you to, to speak and ask the question yourself. Great, thanks Amani and thanks again to the speakers for the really interesting talks. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Katya. Um, you're telling us about the uh, modelling in the West Indian Ocean and uh, talk, told us about four uh, different upwelling case studies. Um, so for you as a modeller, um, what are kind of the main hurdles um, that you face when you model um, the desappling system uh, in the Western Indian Ocean? Well, for us, the biggest difficulty when we start looking at the model results, all upwelling systems are unique. So right now, there is no universally applicable method of detecting them uh, in the model. So it takes a lot of um, very focused analysis for each upwelling system, working side, uh, side by side with remote sensing experts. So that, I guess, would be the biggest issue that unless you know that upwelling is there and uh, it is important, you wouldn't otherwise easily detect it. I see. OK, so quite a bit of work, actually. Thank you. Uh, yes, and Anna, yes. uh, Anna um, you uh, give us a really interesting uh, talk about your really holistic approach to ecosystem management <clears throat> and uh, what I find really exciting actually that you will think about threats but also opportunities within your research going forward into the future so um, we can see that some species of fish uh, are either more or less um, uh, um, susceptible to climate change but did you find that some species uh, was there change over time did some become more or less susceptible to climate change? Did you find anything like this? So the, uh, the thanks for the question. So the model doesn't account for adaptation, if that's what you're asking. But so the sensitivities of each species are set off um, at the start of the runs. And then uh, the analysis compares the present decade with different decades in the future. So I showed you the results for the 2040s, but we also looked at uh, one subsequent decade. And what we found was that, um, so, the, so the sensitivities compared based on the change in their distribution. In this case, we look at abundances um, uh, on, on especially in a especially explicit manner. So the sensitivity, what, what the analysis showed was that um, if you took the whole assemblage as one, we actually found that the climate signal does not emerge. And the reason for that is that while some species are strongly uh, sensitive and they, uh, so those were the green, I showed you the example of the, I think it was the tuna, which decreased very sharply across the whole of the EZ, but other species were actually less sensitive. Um, and that on balance did not produce an overall decline in the assemblage that is targeted by artisanal fisheries. So I think I answer your question in that, the, there is a change over time in the different populations and it then affects the whole resource that's targeted by the artisanal sector, but the sensitivities in themselves don't change over time, i.e. we set them up at the start of the modeling runs and that's what we consider throughout the whole analysis. I hope that makes sense. 
it does make sense thanks yeah that that's uh, really interesting though um but it does suggest though then that there could be actually some opportunity so with these kind of fairly long time scales you do now have time to create policy recommendations for tanzania to say well maybe you can um fishing efforts should go uh down certain species rather than others so i guess that that's one of the outcomes from a research is that right Yes, yeah, so um, so if you were to take those results at face value, what it seems is that there might be opportunities offshore particularly, but that the inshore habitats, which are particularly targeted by the artisanal sector, are the most affected. However, I just want to highlight in a massive caveat that these models don't account uh, for um, changes in the key habitats like coral. So a lot of these species um, really need the coral to, 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 to maintain sustainable populations. Um, and so that's a key effect that's missing from this, this work. Um, and also uh, heat waves. So the more extreme climate events are not really captured in these simulations. But yes, based on our, um, on our results, we can provide uh, sp spatial advice about where um, increased effort might be uh, may be possible, but we are really uh, based on these results. I would be particularly concerned about inshore habitats. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I think um, considering the time, uh, I thank all our speakers again, and I hand back to Amani. Thanks, Julian. So I'm just going to hand straight over to to Katya, um, who's going to give us a a summary of readiness and maybe some discussion around that. I just thought we will do a few wrap up remarks on preparedness because Solstice's uh, a regional uh, project uh, proposal was focused on three technologies, marine robotics, ocean modeling and remote sensing. And we made a huge progress on all three of them in capacity development and working in partnership. So I just wanted maybe to ask Matt Palmer and Fatma Jebri, and then I will also do a couple of words on ocean modeling to give your final few sentence uh, perspective on how much we achieved and what is the way forward. So maybe over to you, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Um, we had a little bit longer time today, I think, to, to sort of highlight some of those. And like I said, there is a um, there's a reference that Alani provided in the chat to anyone to link through to that paper that I've mentioned, which does set out not necessarily a roadmap. I'm not sure we were that far in our understanding, but at least some recommendations that seem to be coming out of the work that we did. I mean, to go back to that roadmap point, I think further work is is actually needed because I mean the. the from the terms of in terms of the sort of technology and in terms of the marine robots and um, autonomous solutions which of course aren't just the shiny yellow robots we throw in the water but some of the sort of autonomous intelligent data solutions that we are being developed all the time and that improves the capability of that type of equipment so it does there is growing potential to take away some of the burden for instance for actually trying to fly these things through the water uh, kennedy mentioned earlier about how many people might be required to run these bits of kit and that might still be up in sort of significant numbers of people and still maybe require some sort of ship support and the more we can do um, to try and provide some of the solutions to help minimize the costs uh, there to take some of the, the simpler tasks that but some of the ones that are quite over still um, so for instance um, sort of uh, autonomous command and control so that people aren't necessarily always looking um, to make sure these very expensive bits of kit aren't getting lost or broken. Obstacle avoidance, these are all bits of work that are going on in the background. They're all, all fairly slow levels of development, but we need to make sure that they feed back through so that people can cherry pick the bits that are most relevant to them. And I think trying to identify um, the two ends that I mentioned at the uh, end of my talk, if anyone missed it, but you know, there's two ways, I think, to look at this really, in that either providing, if individual nations aren't necessarily able to invest fully in themselves to, to, to increase that capacity, to, to um, in, uh, invest in that infrastructure, whichever the technology development you're talking about, um, can they look at regional solutions, regional hubs? Can they uh, look at how they best share uh, resources, uh, particularly skills, I think, as well, 
uh, and opportunities. How funding works across national boundaries is always a tricky one, but um, I think that's worth looking at. And then the other end of that is how do uh, regional actors here actually stay part of the conversation? Because if they require different needs, for instance, smaller, cheaper vehicles than maybe some of their more wealthy um, national counterparts, they need to be part of the discussion around that R&D process. So they need to make sure they've got something for fit, that's fit for purpose in 5, 10, 15 years. Um, so more questions than answers, I think, at the minute. <laughs> um, I think there's a bit more work done to be done in trying to help set out that technology roadmap. Um, but I hope we made some good progress there. I think we got certainly got good feedback on online. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, Fatma, are you with us? Any yes, comments with you? You've done a huge amount of work in, uh, work in, in your own uh, lead research, but also uh, in collaboration with Kenya and Tanzania and South African scientists. So a few comments from you. Yeah, I think um, like the use of satellite observation has 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 been really uh, huge and very beneficial to the whole project, as you said, Katya, and specifically, I think for uh, our Western Indian Ocean partners. Um, I think the way forward uh, about that. So at, at the beginning of the project, there was for sure uh, like um, some kind of like um, I wouldn't say an issue, but um, the intention was. Uh, to try and um, make this uh, satellite data more accessible and uh, also easier to be used in whatever research question we have, especially from the Western Indian Ocean side. And for sure, uh, we've been able together to um, tackle many of the questions we had, but th there is still, I think, a need um, especially from like the Western Indian Ocean side on how to continue using this data, um, especially that there will be a new generation of satellite data that would require maybe um, new types of methods to be used and to apply and to answer our questions. So yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Great, thanks Fatma. And I think from uh, my modeling perspective, when we started the project, I think that uh, the biggest challenge with modeling and capacity development was in lacking really convincing examples, existing examples to persuade our partner institutions and modeling is something worth investing into. And also getting a message across that it is a huge effort and requires skills. And yes, it requires investment into people who would be uh, doing it for their training, for their time to spend. So uh, that was our biggest challenge. So I think we succeeded quite a lot with convincing many institutions. I think probably uh, most successful one uh, was in uh, Kenya, convincing countries that yes, something very useful is coming from those modeling efforts. It's not just purely theoretical. Uh, improving our understanding of uh, physics. Now it has direct relevance to the fisheries and the understanding how to manage that fishery and probably on the Gulas Bank as well, but that is still remain to be seen. We might be close to develop an early warning system based again on joint effort between modeling and remote sensing. So yeah, we have achieved a lot. Uh, there is still a lot to achieve, but I think I'm coming to the same a conclusion as Matthew and as Fatima Jebri that one of the best way forward is uh, go forward in collaboration. So that's what we need to keep doing, building collaborations and uh, working together because it's not only individual skills to work with models, it's also skills of working with other experts in this modeling expertise and using this expertise. So that, that's my final thoughts. Any other comments from anyone on this topic before we conclude our seminar series? Well, 
If not, then I would like to thank you all very much for your participations, especially to those who are stuck with us for all uh, four webinars through this month. It was great. We had lots of really excellent discussions. And as Amani already mentioned, all papers, as soon as they're published, appear on our websites and all the contacts uh, contacts are there, so please uh, get in touch, stay in touch, and stay safe in these difficult times. Thank you very much again, and uh, goodbye from all of us.